thank you everyone thank you for the invitation and uh, apologize for uh, this delay for the technical issue uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here and to share some of uh, our work with you so uh, basically uh, uh, we are a, a systems immunology research group and the main uh, focus of research in our group is basically to leverage the power of uh, artificial intelligence and large language models to uh, contribute decoding antigen specific T cell. As uh, we all know, uh, T cell response basically is triggered upon T cell interaction with antigens and the interaction occurs between T cell receptors and short antigenic peptides that uh, basically, they are attached to this uh, uh, so-called specialized MHC-presenting molecules that sit on the surface of the target cell. Uh, and upon interaction, uh, T cell is obviously activated. It uh, undergoes proliferation, and uh, uh, it basically circulates in the body uh, to uh, uh, find and uh, uh, eliminate the designated uh, cells. So these are kind of really the foundations of what we know about this interaction, but there are many more questions that we don't know. For instance, we don't know how T cells distinguish between uh, uh, self and uh, non-self antigens. Uh, we cannot yet predict which antigen a given TCR is going to uh, react to. And conversely, we cannot predict uh, uh, you know, which TCRs are going to react to a given uh, uh, antigen. And more generally speaking, making map between TCRs and their target antigens, uh, you know, it's a seemingly simple question, but it, uh, it has turned out to be really complicated and difficult to address, even in the era of machine learning and data science. And this is basically at the heart of uh, my uh, research. And it is also worth noting that the, the, in this question, uh, really holds uh, significant potential from both discovery science point of view and also translational science uh, point of view. And it's at the heart of uh, serious human diseases. For example, in cancer and from discovery science point of view, we all know that since a cell encounters a mutation, there is quite a lot of interaction between uh, those malignant cells and tumors, but, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, T cell, but what we don't really know how this interaction impacts downstream evolution of the tumor or basically shapes the uh, composition and architecture of our uh, immune repertoire. Or from uh, this uh, the translational science point of view, it is really at the heart of most of uh, cancer immunotherapies, if not all. For instance, this uh, so-called new antigen-based uh, personalized vaccine the idea or the theory here is to identify uh, person-specific, cancer-specific neoantigens that are immunogenic and then make some vaccines and deliver to patient. And upon uh, basically injection, these antigens will be picked up by uh, antigen presenting cells, will be presented to T cells, and then T cells will actually do their job finding and eliminating tumors. For infectious diseases, I, I believe uh, uh, COVID-19 was really a good example to see the importance of the interaction in addressing fundamental questions, such as uh, basically the variability of disease outcome uh, or basically response to uh, vaccination. I'll come back to this, but I would like to actually give you more a specific example in uh, autoinflammatory and autoimmune disease. One basically common denominator of all of these diseases is really at the end of the day, uh, you find a population of antigen specific T cells, but you don't know basically where their antigen specificity come from. So in our example, uh, in collaboration with uh, other colleagues in uh, human immunology unit, we set out to look into uh, molecular and cellular uh, differences and similarities of two auto inflammatory diseases, ulcerative colitis and checkpoint colitis. Uh, uh, checkpoint-induced colitis. This checkpoint-induced colitis is basically a disease that cancer patients get after going through checkpoint blocker treatment. In terms of uh, pathology, it's very similar to ulcerative colitis. And in fact, 
some of the drugs and treatments that are used for ulcerative colitis are also applied for uh, treating uh, uh, checkpoint induced colitis. The severity is very variable from very mild to very severe at the level that they terminate cancer treatment. Uh, yeah, and it, it is estimated that up to 60% of cancer patients of their treatment actually develop this uh, disease. And therefore, the, that was the reason we set out to look into this. We collected uh, data from healthy individuals from uh, 12 ulcerative colitis patients. And for this ulcerative colitis, we collected data from inflamed tissue and healthy tissue and about 16 uh, checkpoint-induced colitis. And for checkpoint-induced colitis, we collected data from basically those patients that developed this disease and those that they didn't. And we took a multimodal uh, single cell strategy, collected data from transcriptomic, proteomic, and TCR and BCR, and also some uh, spatial, basically, uh, data to look into uh, tissue level similarities and differences that I wouldn't actually going to say anything about that. But one thing among the other things actually captured our uh, attention was basically a pattern that we see in clonotype sharing from blood to tissue. And I, what I forgot to tell that this data that we got was paired from blood and tissue. And when we were comparing the clonotype sharing between uh, uh, cellular populations that we had identified both from blood and tissue, what we observed was that whereas for in healthy individuals, uh, whereas you see basically kind of a compartmentalized, uh, basically a pattern where uh, tissue population share uh, colonotype with each other and health and blood uh, colonotype, blood uh, subpopulations share uh, colonotype with each other, that was not the case for ulcerative colitis. And you see very strong, this basically edges reflect the colonotype sharing between different populations. You see very strong, a colonotype sharing between some uh, blood uh, subpopulations and tissue subpopulations. This is suggestive of uh, there are some T cells that perhaps uh, traffic from blood to inflamed tissue. Uh, with uh, And as you see here, they have kind of uh, basically activating phenotype and they are cytotoxic also. Uh, that is suggestive of perhaps these T cells are uh, contributing to the inflammation. What obviously there are different signatures between these two different uh, inflammatory diseases. But what we didn't know, and this is what I said as a common denominator between all inflammatory diseases, is that we don't know antigen specificity of these TCRs. And when we uh, basically compare these TCRs with TCRs that we knew their antigen specificity, there wasn't enough of similarity to reflect basically perhaps this antigen specificity comes from some bugs or some viruses and so on and so forth. Uh, in a sense, suggestive of basically these autoreactive T cells, they have an unknown antigen specificity that we had to uh, address. And therefore, uh, as you see, this is kind of uh, examples of why it is important to be able to link these two components. On the one hand, we have this uh, so-called peptide MEC complexes on the sitting on the cell surface, and on the other hand, we have these uh, TCRs. The question has turned out to be very difficult to resolve for a number of reasons. One of them, a key one of this, is the high level of diversity between both TCRs at the TCR levels and also at peptide MHC levels. Uh, I, I'm, not go, I'm not going to basically go through the details of it, but if we put one step back in the timers and see basically where this diversity come from, we see that obviously we have you know VDJ recombination at one point and then insertion of uh, uh, some uh, random nucleotide at junction positions. And once you have this chain form for beta, then you have alpha chain, VDJ recombination for alpha chain, then pairing up. And then on top of that, you have to basically selection, positive selection and negative selection in timers. And eventually in theory, you should have a repertoire, which is actually sensitive enough to protect us versus any uh, future pathogens and specific enough to basically not to make some uh, autoinflammatory issues. So you see basically the source of diversity in TCR side. And at the peptide MHC side, uh, from the time that a cell either encounters a virus or basically encounters a mutation, there is a very long multi-step and stochastic basically uh, route 
until these uh, short peptides are actually attached to peptide MHC complexes and they sit on the surface of the cell. And more importantly, not all of these basically peptide MHCs that are on the cell surface, they trigger T cell response, only a fraction of them they do. And we don't know basically what are the characteristics of those immunogenic uh, peptide MHC. And that is uh, another basically key question that we uh, uh, focus on. So uh, uh, historically, there has been actually a long interest uh, on uh, both computational side and, uh, uh, and uh, experimental side to address this problem. In experimental side, there are actually tons of uh, assays and protocols out there, but very generally speaking, we can group them into two different groups. If, if we have, basically, if we, uh, a priori, we know the antigens of interest, then we can actually attach them to uh, uh, HLA molecules of interest, uh, you know, using uh, one of these uh, single cell technologies such as 10x dextamer, and then uh, basically put this uh, multiplex pool of the MHC complexes in front of single cell, and then we will capture these T cells with known to be with the TCRs basically profiled in addition to transcriptomic and proteomic and so on and so forth. This technology has proven very powerful and basically boosted both computational and, uh, and experimental approaches. Uh, but the main problem here is that uh, this technology will work only if you know the antigens a priori. And in examples that I showed you, the antigens are unknown. And therefore, this technology is not going to work in cases like that, that actually most of the time is our uh, basically problem. On the other hand, if we know the TCR of interest and we want to see which antigens they are actually targeting, we can use, again, there are different basically approaches, but one good example is this so-called uh, combinatorial uh, synthetic yeast display approach, where you can basically synthetically generate all the possible either nine mers or 10 mers, attach them to a uh, HLA molecule of interest, and then uh, you know those that are presented by this, uh, to put them in front of your T cell, and then eventually you will get a population of these uh, uh, complexes uh, attached to your uh, TCR of interest. Again, this is very, very powerful because, uh, you know, down the line, you can do more computational and mathematical modeling to identify the common features of targets for, for, for the uh, peptide MHCs and use those to basically predict future uh, targets. In computational side, again, there are it's a very, very hot uh, topic, and we see quite a lot of uh, emerging uh, uh, models and approaches. But very generally speaking, we can actually group them again into two groups. We have these uh, so-called supervised predictive models. These are applicable for basically uh, 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 TCRs with non-antigen specificities. And we have actually millions of them. And the idea here is that. Basically, these are labeled data. The idea here is that to develop a predictive model these days, mostly uh, deep neural network, train the model, and eventually, or theoretically, you should be able to predict which antigen a given TCR is going to basically react to. Uh, but the issue here is that as uh, we and others have shown, uh, these approaches, for those antigens that for, for, for which you have a good number of basically data points in your training data, the accuracy you are going to get is about 70 to 80 percent. It's okay, it's not perfect, it's okay. But the issue is that for unknown antigens, for those that you don't have enough TCRs in this uh, training data, and there, as you see here, it's just you know flipping a crane and making a prediction. Uh, on the other hand, we have this so-called unsupervised clustering models. And here, uh, these are originally to deal with situ situations like the data that we get from, uh, for instance, SiteSeq, these orphan TCRs that we are getting from technologies such, uh, such as SiteSeq. And we have actually uh, uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of these TCRs out there. And the idea here is that, obviously, to start with an embedding strategy to basically translate this uh, sequence data into some machine uh, readable uh, numerical values and then apply some clustering strategy to identify these so-called common specificity groups and then uh, basically zoom in on this by developing some other uh, again computational approaches 
to identify either sequence features of this as illustrated here, or a structural features of this, or physical chemical properties of each of these common specificity groups. And once you have done that, in theory, at least you should be able to basically uh, make some statements which antigens this specificity group is going to recognize or future TCR will be sitting in which of these common specificity groups. Again, these are very promising and powerful basically strategies. But the problem is that we uh, decided to look into performance of a number of commonly used uh, uh, clustering algorithms. And in addition to that, we introduced three uh, basically basic models, one clustering based on randomly basically, the other one clustering based on mm, sequence length, and the other one uh, clustering based on Hamming distance. And this Hamming distance is very simple, basically uh, a string comparison. And as you see here, Whereas this uh, basically a state of the earth model are uh, outperforming random and length based clustering, they are not actually doing much better than as a simple Hamming distance uh, clustering. And this suggests that there is actually quite a lot of room for improvement here. And additionally, as you see here, we just zoomed in into each of these uh, common specificity groups to uh, see which of these models can actually give us the sequence features and what is. Uh, basically clear here that Hamming distance gives you almost the same as you get from this state of the earth models. And again, this suggests that there's actually quite a lot of basically, uh, uh, you know, improvement needed here. Uh, so on top of this, basically, uh, you know, uh, top level supervised and uh, clustering approaches, sometimes there are some ad hoc approaches that's, you know, a combination of both that actually uh, turn out to be very successful, at least in some immunological context. In one example, at the uh, basically beginning of the COVID-19, where one key question was the variability of the disease outcome, and obviously the prime suspect was the role of T cells, and in particular T cell cross-reactivity to common uh, coronaviruses. We took such a strategy and we showed that actually T cell cross-reactivity is not just black and white that is debated, but uh, it's basically variable uh, across different HLA types. And this uh, was purely computational, but uh, shortly after it was actually similar observation were, were actually made by some large clinical uh, studies. And it is not just uh, this example, we see this you know, in, for example, in large scale uh, combat consortium or this beautiful study by uh, Ali Lebadi and Paul Thomas from US, where they were looking into variability of uh, basically uh, response to mRNA vaccination. Uh, so, if uh, so, hopefully, I have actually given you uh, you know a background of what the question is and why it's difficult and what is uh, basically already known. So, the question remains open, and we in our group we set out to uh, contribute to this, and we have broken this into different questions. Uh, obviously, the very first one is that what are the common features of these target antigens? If you know, if you have a peptide MAC that triggers this response, what are either sequence features or physical chemical properties or the uh, 3D conformational structure that make them immunogenic? The other one is correlates of TCR. The same question can be asked basically in target uh, TCRs, those that react to these antigens and also uh, structural correlates. And this is something that, you know, it was known for a long time, but because of the difficulties of getting a structural information, it wasn't possible, but now because of, you know, models such as AlphaFold, uh, this inferior structural actually offers the opportunity to incorporate those uh, structural information into uh, patterns of T cell antigen specificity. And also, and uh, you know, more importantly, I believe that this question needs to be basically studied under different uh, or a specific immunological or uh, context specific manner. Otherwise it's too difficult to uh, give a very generic uh, basically uh, a solution for that. So for the remaining of this uh, seminar, I will just uh, uh, focus on the first one because uh, because of the time. So, uh, and let's, let's start with basically looking into uh, correlates of T cell cross reactivity. Here by cross-reactivity, I mean a T cell basically uh, 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 reacting to different antigens. 
And while back, we collected a number of uh, TCRs here. What you see, these are the uh, beta chain sequence of TCRs. And because these are cross-reactive TCRs, we collected their targets, peptides or short peptides, either nine mers as you see here and 10 mers here. And we applied some basic, basically, uh, uh, you know, clustering or uh, dimension reduction strategy. And then we saw that there is actually some clustering is going on. And by focusing on this, what we observed was that perhaps these basically short motifs that are sitting in TCR contact position make this clustering. And uh, please note that this uh, position two and position nine, these are anchor positions, and which is very conserved different between different HLAs, and these are key for uh, peptide presentation. And this position from three to position eight, these are mostly called TCR contact position. And for us, this was basically of interest. And this clustering that we see here is not because of anchor position, because here we have basically taken an HLA stratified approach. And the same you see here for 10 mers, that again, you see this short motif here that we thought perhaps is making this clustering. So this type of basically observation, a small observation that other people have actually made uh, even in a more comprehensive way, is suggestive of the fact that if we had TCRs and their target antigens, then perhaps it could be possible to link these two. But the problem is that we don't have basically good enough of this type of data. And therefore we had to generalize our assumption and forget about TCRs and just ask the question, what are the features of immunogenic peptides? In a sense, if you have a peptide that triggers T-cell response, what is actually in that, that uh, interests T-cells? So we started by asking the question of what is the probability of seeing each of the amino acids in each of these TCR contact positions? And here we took a, a simple Bayesian approach. It was basically a, a multivariate uh, yeah, Bayesian model with the threshold distribution. And uh, what the, the outcome, what we observed from it was that, whereas for some amino acids, for, for, for example, for this one or that one, you see very basically local impact, meaning that if this amino acid uh, appears in position four, it makes it more likely to be either immunogenic or non-immunogenic. And for some other basically uh, amino acid, we see some kind of more universal approach, uh, uni universal impact. Uh, obviously this observation that we made here is data specific. Perhaps if we look into another data, we will see a slightly different basically uh, a pattern or observation. But the take home message here is that in fact, uh, sequent amino acid constituents of TCR, pep uh, TCR contact positions of peptides play a role in basically making uh, immunogenic peptides. And then we uh, expanded this uh, from looking or asking the role of amino acid. We asked this time, what is the role of uh, or enrichment of short peptides? in TCR contact position among immunogenic versus non-immunogenic. And again, using a Bayesian model. And the outcome was that where we see actually some short motifs here, I'm showing you trimmers that are basically enriched in immunogenic. And there are some other uh, uh, basically short K-mers or trimmers that are depleted in immunogenic peptides. And again, this is actually suggestive of this sequence composition uh, is actually a a, a factor in making immunogenic versus non-immunogenic. And these were just, you know, sequence features, but there are some other features. For instance, in this uh, very comprehensive uh, study from a consortium, basically, approach, uh, they look, they ask the same question, what are the uh, features or correlates of uh, immunogenic in the context of con cancer? And uh, they conclude that features of immunogenicity are grouped into two groups. One are uh, presentation features and recognition features. For presentation features, they have this binding affinity, tumor abundance, and binding stability, whereas for uh, recognition features, it's uh, agrotopicity and foreignness. Agrotopicity is basically uh, affinity of uh, mutant normalized to wild type, and foreignness is that how dissimilar is a mutant or uh, neantigen uh, in cancer patient compared to self peptides. So now thinking about this, uh, basically uh, correlates of immunogenicity and those that I showed you in uh, previous slide, obviously this 
Yeah, now this correlates is good to uh, machine learners to develop some models to predict uh, immunogenic peptides. And we have a good number of them out there. And again, during COVID, because we were actually uh, you know, involved in uh, uh, COVID uh, studies, we thought it's a good idea to see whether these uh, models which are out there can predict CD8 T cell targets from COVID uh, genome or not. And the idea was that because COVID was an emerging, firstly, we had good amount of data, functionally validated data. And secondly, and more importantly for this, those functionally validated data weren't included in training data of these models here. And what actually turned out to be the case, as you see here, the outcome or the prediction of these models is really at the random level. They, they weren't able to predict CD T cell target from uh, SARS-CoV-2. And then we asked, what about cancers? And again, we have some uh, data from uh, glioblastoma patients uh, that generated in our department, and they weren't in the training data of models. And we kind of got the same basically conclusion there that these actually do not work on cancer either. And then the question was that, okay, what are the problems? What are the basically source of the problem here? If we have basically comprehensively looked into this, but three major problems. One was that, we observed that cancer and viral epitopes do not share universal features of immunogenicity. That I'll explain in a minute what I mean by that. The second is HLA bias in the data and basically a poor way of dealing with this HLA bias. And then the third one, even in the context of viral diseases, sequence features are not shared equally between different viruses. And this is something that needs to be basically considered when developing models. So just let me show you what I mean by when I say that uh, features of immunogenesis is not shared between cancer and uh, viral epitopes. So here I'm showing you the distribution of binding affinities, either in cancer or uh, immunogen or uh, viral epitopes. And this positive are those that are immun immunogenic from functional assays and negative that those that they were actually uh, not uh, triggering T cell response. Whereas we see a lower level of uh, basically binding affinity for positive in both, which is actually a good thing to see. What we see in, uh, very strange is that the, the distribution of negative in cancer is almost equal to distribution of positive in, uh, in viral epitopes. And this shouldn't be actually the case. And therefore, if you blindly use these models without actually thinking about the parameters or the underlying basically logic for development or data that they used for training the data, then most certainly you are going to trouble. And that is the reason you know the prediction turns out to be random. And the same is for binding stability. As you see here again, as we correctly see a positive in both, they have higher binding stability. What we see here is that uh, you know positive and negative, they share almost the same uh, distribution. So that was the one issue. The other one, this HLA bias uh, that I said uh, that they usually are not uh, treated well. So what you see here is basically training data of one of the models. And in that training data, as you see, uh, negative, uh, sorry, positive ones are mainly coming from HLA-A201. The rest are mostly negative. And if you don't actually deal with this disproportionate basically distribution, then the model picks up whatever it sees in this as basically positive. And actually we tested this by asking these models that are immunogenicity models. They have been developed to predict immunogenic versus non-immunogenic. And we asked them to predict HLA types. And actually it turned out that they predict HLA types better than peptide immunogenicity, partly because of that. And the second one is what I have described it here, because as I said earlier, the uh, anchor position, they have very conserved per HLA conserved motifs. And as you see here, this is basically the case for different HLAs and uh, for full length sequence. If you don't take that into account, then obviously these very beautiful patterns that are basically driven by uh, anchor position will make your model to pick up HLAs instead of immunogenic and non-immunogenic. And the third issue was the, the fact that even sequence features are not fairly distributed between different viruses. Here, I'm showing you three different scenarios. In the first scenario, we have collected all the data, viral data that we had from IEDB at the time, and we basically split them randomly, 90% train, 10% test, 
And then we looked into uh, the sequence motif at TCR contact position. What you see here is almost the same motif that you see here and there, okay? But if you uh, put all the non source code to as a train and keep the source code to as a test and then look at the same uh, basically motif, you see that these two are no linear similar to each other. And this is not only for SARS CoV 2. Here, we also looked into uh, vaccinia virus. Again, you see that what we get from the training is uh, basically not similar to what we get from the test. And for that, if we take this strategy blindly, we get this and we will be happy with that. But if we basically use any of these, that, you know, in scenarios when you have uh, uh, emerging virus such as SARS-CoV-2, and you don't have any uh, basically prior data of this in your training data, then obviously they are not going to work. And then uh, uh, Chloe, a PhD student at the time in my group, she decided to basically address these problems. And she developed a model that eventually she called it a trap and uh, just came out a couple of months ago in uh, genome medicine. And uh, in, in that model, she tried to basically address these issues. There are a number of actually novel things in her model. Firstly, uh, she basically leverages uh, this uh, cutting edge uh, deep neural network. She uses a, a, a transfer learning for basically uh, for, for her embedding in her model. And then in terms of architecture, her model has two key components. In the first component, she actually cuts out the anchor position and focuses only on TCR contact position. And this basically simple strategy, uh, which is a kind of actually uh, agnostic, is uh, you know surprisingly actually uh, uh, perfect for dealing with HLA bias and sometimes with a little amount of data that you have for some HLAs and uh, it's dominant by some other HLAs. And then the second component is where to incorporate other basically features of immunogenicity that we know, for example, binding stability or uh, binding basically scores and so on and so forth. And this combination of two improves the prediction. In addition, the model is not just a classifier, it provides you with some confidence scores. And for those with high confidence score, the user is okay to go ahead and do some uh, experiments of functional validation for the prediction. For the low uh, confidence scores, she basically introduces another model that actually uh, has turned out to be very handy. And there, see, for viral epitopes, basically she, uh, for, for, yeah, for, for, uh, she compares them with, all, uh, with either autoantigens or uh, cancer intestine uh, antigens. And the idea here is basically cross-reactivity. So if the chances are that perhaps what we uh, get here is a false negative, if we compare them with this that we know they have been already a target for T cell, then perhaps we can basically uh, prevent that uh, false negative prediction. So that was the model. And in, for the rest, I'm basically going to show an application of uh, this model. So we know that at the basically beginning of Omicron, one key question was that whether the T cell uh, basically immunity has escaped or is uh, there. To basically address this type of the question with the limited data that uh, we had at the time, uh, we decided to actually give it a go. And uh, we started by comparing uh, Wuhan as a wild type and comparing those to uh, Omicron as a basically mutant. And the first scenario is that, uh, so if you have a peptide in Wuhan, one possibility is that it's conserved, there is no mutation, but for mutated, perhaps you have uh, in one of the subtypes of Omicron or more than one, they are mutated. And then the very first stage for T cell response is pres peptide presentation. We had three different scenarios, both wild type and mutant are presented almost equally. The second scenario was that in Wuhan, the peptide was presented, but in uh, Omicron, after mutation, it's no longer presented. And we had a few examples that in Wuhan, it wasn't presented well, but it, 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 the presentation was improved in, after uh, uh, mutant. And then uh, the final, basically, a score was for us to model a T cell uh, response. We said that, okay, T cell response mathematically is a function of presentation and immunogenicity. And uh, for uh, presentation, 
we were basically uh, I lost my mouse. Um, yeah, for presentation, we infer this presentation from uh, some uh, uh, publicly available tools such as NetMSCPAN. And for immunogenicity, we used TRAP, the model that I just introduced you. Uh, uh, and then uh, the, this uh, multiplication of this actually makes our final T cell response. And once we have this, then we simulate some data to actually create all the observed mutations that we have in Omicron or Delta and so on and so forth, and unobserved perhaps future mutation. We pretty much basically create all those mutations. And we also incorporate uh, uh, basically physical chemical properties of uh, these peptides into model. Mm -hmm. And eventually we develop a, a neighbor network strategy to ask the question, how likely is that a mutation at the position is a likely escape route for the peptide for the, or for the virus? So just starting with the presentation, just to show what's going on, these are the basically presentation scores for Wuhan compared to Omicron, and these are basically a log transform of this, and this is a threshold that we usually people use. These are the basic binders, these are non-binders. And the difference is that level. The, the, although comparing just distribution, it looks like that this basically is a significant difference, but I personally wouldn't believe that. It's just, you know, that the trend is important here, not this p-value that people usually show here. But if we actually zoom in at the uh, super type level for different basically HLA supertypes, and in particular for spike drive peptides, then what we see is a significant difference in BO7. And because of that, we zoom farther on BO7 at the mutation level. And what we observed actually this one that caught our attention. And what you see here, there are two mutation in Omicron. Each of them have actually uh, destroyed a presentation in two HLA types. <clears throat> and funny enough for us, and here, sorry, I'm looking at agrotopicity, which is a binding of Omicron normalized to Wuhan. And what is interesting here is that this motif here that are shared between these two uh, uh, mutants. And this is basically, which is called uh, a motif that is in super antigens. At the time we didn't know, but it turned out that actually this is super antigen motif. And then we asked, okay, which other peptides or mutations in Omicron carry this super antigen? And we had about 15 of them. And as you see these red ones of their mutation, they have escaped. They are not presented anymore, let me put it this way. And therefore, one take home message here was that after mutation in those peptides that they carry this motif, the presentation is actually narrowed for these HLA types. In a sense, you know, T cells, they see a narrower repertoire of peptides, and these blue ones here. And then we also ask, okay, these, well, what about other peptides, regardless of they carry that pep uh, short motif or not? And these are those peptides that in Omicron, they are not presented. In a sense, on Omicron, these peptides here, they are uh, invisible for, for, for uh, T cells. Uh, and then at the trap level, at immunogenicity level, first we saw that basically uh, the, the model that we had is about 76% accurate in predicting CD8 T cell from SARS-CoV-2, but more importantly, the distribution of scores between Wuhan and uh, control is clear. And then at the final immunogenicity score, this is the basically distribution of scores uh, of T cell response. And again, it's really difficult to say this is significant or not, perhaps not, but more importantly, and the take home message here should be that Whereas the distribution of scores between Omicron and Wuhan is the same, we have these uh, few peptides that after mutation in Omicron, they have become non-immunogenic and these are the problematic ones. Uh, and then we, uh, as I said earlier, so we, um, yeah, then uh, simulating basically observed and non-observed, integrating physical chemical and taking this, uh, uh, neighborhood uh, approach to ask, you know, more general question to see a bigger picture. So uh, what I show you here is basically the T cell response trajectory. Positive means that after looking at this basically combinatorial space of the all the mutants that we created, including observed and future mutants, 
These positives actually means that the T-cell response will be there. Negative will be those that and basically the T-cell response has probably been escaped. But a good way of actually interpreting this is that this is basically the way I would like to uh, explain that. You can basically think of this as a control because nothing interesting is uh, basically there. But if you pick up a, a random uh, position in the peptide and introduce a random mutation, then in these peptides here that we have labeled as impaired, you are more likely that the T-cell response is no longer there. But these are the peptides that T-cell response is perhaps there. So in a sense, although this is very short, basically a small data that needs to be basically backed up with more data, in a sense for future uh, uh, variants, these type of peptides will be more secure for vaccine development because immunogenicity will be there or T cell response will be there. And these are the peptides should be avoided in because you know upon mut future mutant, they are likely to basically uh, have lost the T cell immunogenicity. And then obviously the next question is that we have Wuhan in our hand. Can we predict by looking into Wuhan data whether which category this peptide can be in? Again, the data is not statistically powered to address this question, but we could see basically some correlates of it. For example, the number of HLAs that each peptide is presented is one factor, basically one playing factor, and physical chemical properties of the constituent of the peptide is another uh, factor. And the, for the last three or four minutes, I would like to actually show you how uh, you can actually zoom in with this strategy or with this model to address more specific questions. So here, what I'm showing you, I have chosen one peptide from this end of the category, this end of the population, those that T cell response was enhanced by looking at the combinatorial space. And this is basically uh, the, the diagram we had created at the time under time pressure. So this is immunogenicity score from uh, blue to a kind of reddish. And reddish mean is basically immunogenic, meaning that TSA response is there. And blue means that TSA response is no longer there. So this peptide, as you see in Omicron, this was the mutation. And this mutation is in this position, it's here. And this is kind of red, meaning that, or actually I can say that pretty much all the positions are immunogenic in a sense you know, all the escape routes are closed because, you know, the mutation is likely to uh, not to escape the T-cell immunogenicity. And therefore that's the reason it's this site here. But now, yeah, it's still another because this is basically a super antigen. I thought it's of, of course important to look into. You see again, pretty much all the escape routes are closed. But interestingly, in the, the only escape route that perhaps is open is uh, position two. And in the position two, the mutant is the most deleterious mutant it could be basically. And I guess this is one reason explaining those basically uh, uh, some of the observation that we were seeing. And the final one, one from this side here, and uh, this side, you know, the mutant, we saw that the immunogenicity is escaped or any mutation is likely to give actually, uh, you know, poorer immunogenicity to the peptide. And this is also uh, clear from this uh, network that you see pretty much all the, these modules are kind of blue, blue color, meaning that the immunogenicity is not there upon a future mutation. But luckily the mutation occurred in this position, although it, it the basically collective route is closed, but the mutant itself is one of the most uh, basically and deleterious uh, mutant. And I guess uh, I will uh, stop here by just wrapping up uh, the, the, you know, some of the things that I discussed with you that really this uh, problem of T cell antigen specificity is at the heart of uh, uh, most uh, human diseases, both from uh, transcript, uh, to, from uh, discovery and translational science and point of view. And it's an open question and it's really complex to address. And we have been taking different strategies to deal with that. Today, I just talked about T cell cross reactivity or features of peptide immunogenicity. And I also introduced you a model that we have developed to identify uh, peptide immunogenicity. And I illustrated uh, one application of the model. 
and to just uh, basically acknowledge my group members. Uh, Chloe developed the, the model the trap. Uh, Paul, uh, he applied the model on Omicron. And uh, yeah, pretty much uh, everyone contributed at different uh, basically uh, levels of contribution and the funding bodies. And uh, last but not least, uh, I have a position open and please uh, join us. Thank you.